I can barely see you, but I'm, I know I believe that you are here, so thank you. Um, you know, I think every night at the House of Speakeasy is a fabulous one, but I do think that tonight is particularly special because, as Lucas said, it is the birthday of my book. Um, <laughs> um, I'm excited. Um, after years sweating over sentences, it is finally here, and I'm just so honored and excited to be here celebrating with all of you. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about art tonight, which uh, admittedly feels a little surreal because for a long time, art and I were not on speaking terms. Going to galleries and museums reliably made me feel like I was at least three tattoos and a master's degree away from figuring out what was going on. And I don't know, maybe some of you here have had that experience. You know, you go to these like aggressively lit galleries with their impeccable white walls and hushed rooms, and you turn the corner and there's all these people staring gravely at a sculpture of limp vegetables on a stained mattress. And you think, everyone's got the punchline except me. It's just one of those things, right? You know, art sometimes makes us feel like idiots. It's, it's unavoidable, it's just one of those things. But I'm here to talk about why it's not. There's a hidden logic to the way the art world tries to keep you out, but there's a way around it. Now, I can't imagine that that much would have changed in my relationship with art, but a few years back, I was at my childhood home in Oregon, helping my mom purge her basement, when I discovered a painting by my late grandmother inspired by her time as a Holocaust survivor in a displaced persons camp. And you know, my, my grandmother always treated art as essential, this thing she turned to when life turned itself inside out. I didn't know that feeling. I'd always thought of art as a luxury, but her painting trailed me back to New York and it kept dancing my mind round and round this question of whether by turning my back on art, I was missing out on something big. And so I decided, okay, I'm gonna try this whole art thing again. You know, I'm older, I'm wiser, it's gonna go better this time around. And so I started poking around the art world and I have to be honest, a lot of the art I saw was, to me, barely recognizable as art. But the people I met fascinated me. I'd never met a group of people that was willing to sacrifice so much for something of so little obvious practical value. <laughs> these, you know, these artists, they, they treated 100-year-old paintings like they were as necessary as vital organs. These gallery owners maxed out credit cards to show hunks of metal they swore could change the world. And I was surprised to learn that scientists are actually right there with the artists in declaring art a fundamental part of our humanity. As one biologist put it, as necessary to us as food or sex. Now, as I kept going around and, and looking at these art fiends ooing and eyeing over you know, a sculpture of a brutalized chair, I kept wondering, you know, why? Why do we engage with art anyway? What does it do for us? And I was also intrigued because these people behaved like they'd accessed this trap door in their brains. I mean, their reality operated according to totally different rules of nature that I did not know. And it made my own claustrophobic, exist, my own existence feel claustrophobic compared to this expansive life they'd crafted for themselves. And to be fair, they pitied me. Uh, they told me I lacked visual literacy or an eye, which they swore was a huge liability in a world so saturated with images. And so I became consumed with this question of whether I could see art, whether I could see the world the way they did, and what would change if I could. And I decided I was going to throw myself into the nerve center of the fine art world and see what I could find. When I say throw myself in, I do mean it pretty literally. I'm a journalist, and like a lot of journalists, I do interviews, I read research reports, but I also believe in learning by doing. And I had this plan, this admittedly pushy plan that I was going to go work in the art world and then report back on what I found. Unfortunately, no one except me thought this was a good idea. I started reaching out to art experts, hoping to talk to them, and instead of answers, I got threats, <laughs> warnings. I had uh, connoisseurs assure me that my plan was impossible, maybe even dangerous. 
Now, I've done reporting in China where talking to a foreign journalist can get someone thrown in jail, but nothing prepared me for how tight-lipped the art world would be. I had truly an easier time sniffing out answers in Chengdu than in Chelsea. I, I, yeah, I felt like an FBI agent trying to get in with the mob. Um, now, I, I, I was surprised, admittedly. I think, you know, for me, based on everything the art world advertised about itself, I had this idea that I'd find this group of open-minded iconoclasts who were just so excited about, sh you know, embracing as many people as possible and the warm hug of art. It wasn't until later that I discovered how wrong I was. The art world does have a mean streak, and it's by design. I should say that after speaking with what felt like half the population of Brooklyn, I did get a gig working as an assistant in a very cool up-and-coming gallery in Brooklyn, this sort of out-of-the-way spot for the in-the-know. And as I started spackling walls and writing press releases, I began to get initiated into how the art world uses this strategic snobbery to keep people out. But first, my boss informed me I needed a makeover. I hate to break it to you, he told me one afternoon, but you're not the coolest cat in the art world, so having you around, it's just like lowering my coolness. <laughs> he encouraged me, uh, he, I should say, he, he suggested a dress code, severe haircut, no jewelry. He uh, suggested I tone down my superficial enthusiasm. Uh, true connoisseurs, I noticed, exclusively discuss art in an affectless monotone that makes them sound like they're running out of batteries. <laughs> he coached me that certain words were off limits. Uh, an artwork is not sold, it's placed. And encouraged me to develop fluency in art speak. Art speak, of course, is that overly complex way of speaking where basically the bigger the word, the better. Uh, what an art critic calls the indexical marks of the artist's body would be finger painting to you and me. <laughs> These days, to sound like you know something about art, the trick is to sound like a French professor who's been butchered by a ham-fisted translation job, which, it turns out, may be exactly where art speak came from. Um, there is a, an influential report that argues that uh, essentially art speak emerged from a group of influential art critics who started writing in a way that tried to emulate the style of poorly translated essays by prominent French academics. <laughs> uh, um, but you know, I, and I, I don't have to tell you this if you've ever heard art speak, this did not evolve for clear communication. Uh, there's another study that found that, uh, a study of art world press releases that found that the words spatial and non-spatial are used interchangeably. <laughs> um, art speak really evolved to be this exclusionary code, one that distinguishes you as someone that does or does not get it. And now, as I got into the rhythms of the art world, I began to pick up on other ways that, uh, that people tried to exclude the Joe Schmoes, which was my boss's term for general public. <laughs> Where you put your gallery is a big one. A lot of galleries are designed less like stores than speakeasies. You know, up a flight of stairs in a building that could just as easily house apartments with maybe a business card-sized plaque on the outside that probably doesn't include helpful words like art or gallery. And even if you find the word, and I should say, by the way, that you're gonna say, okay, well, ground level spaces are expensive in New York, but it's not only that. To a lot of dealers, a street level storefront was actively undesirable because then you have to deal with, and I quote, random ass people walking in. <laughs> so even if you could find the art, good luck finding out much more than that. Um, straightforwardness was uncouth. Say as little as possible was my boss's advice to a colleague on dealing with buyers. Being borderline hostile was cool. Some collectors, a dealer assured me, they want you to treat them rudely. Now galleries, which is of course art speak for stores, tend not to share their prices. So if you want to find out what something costs, you'll have to ask someone who will tell you, but probably after you take a schmo detector test. What else do you own? How do you make your money? One gallerist recoiled at the idea of selling to people who worked in certain sectors of finance. Your answers will depend what your, your answers will determine what, if anything, you're allowed to buy. 
And while you're judging the art, the gallerist is judging you. So if there was a silver lining to learning all of this, it's that I wasn't nuts. Like, no wonder I'd felt the art world was so alienating. The art world was evidently doing its best to keep out the schmoletariat. <laughs> Keeping the rest of us at arm's length is a way to build mystique, to concentrate powers in the, power in the hands of gatekeepers, to preserve art as this exclusive purview of a self-anointed few. This didn't sit well with me. As I've said, I was dead set on developing my eye, and I gradually turned my entire life over to art. I worked as a security guard in an art museum, guarding a pile of dust that was supposedly a key part of the artwork. Um, I let a na nearly naked stranger sit on my face in the name of art. <laughs> and, you know, something kept bothering me, which was that this, this, these deliberately erected barriers to entry, they didn't just apply to buying the art, but to appreciating it. These art lovers, these, I should say more, these, these art experts that I was meeting, they spent surprisingly little time discussing the merits of the artworks themselves. Instead, they asked, where did the artist go to school? Who else owns the work? Who is he sleeping with? <laughs> this so-called context influenced their judgment of the work so much more than the pieces themselves. One dealer's go-to question when deciding whether to show an artist was, is this someone I would want to hang out with? So I, I have to tell you that this, like I said, it didn't sit well with me. I felt like I was trying to develop my eye, but I kept being pushed to sort of outsource my opinion to the hive mind. And also, all this emphasis on context felt like one more way to keep out the schmoes, because these connoisseurs, they'd become a lot more important if we told we need our history degree, years of going to art fairs, and certain genes to really commune with a painting. It wasn't until I started working as a studio assistant to some up-and-coming artists that I began to discover a different way. And something really clicked as I sat there on their floors, stretching canvases and painting backgrounds. You know, all this hushed murmuring about indexicality at galleries and museums did not prepare me for the blistery business of making art. Making art is practically athletic. I lost patches of arm hair to a sculpture. I nearly got maimed by staplers. You know, I, I spent hours watching this artist sweating to mix the perfect shade of gray. And watching artists work, it, it helped me begin to understand how to savor art like an artist. I needed to slow down. I needed to examine the physical form. I needed to pay attention to the decisions. We're told. Basically, for the last 100 years, we've been told that what really matters about art these days is the idea behind it. The thought trumps the thing. But as the artist Julie Curtis told me when I worked with her, an idea is not a painting. Painting, she stressed, is constant decision making. These artists, they were part of this rebel alliance that believes that art, even cutting edge art, is for everyone that it's not a luxury, it's a necessity, and that everything we need to have a meaningful experience of art is right in front of us. Now, when I went back to exhibits for the first time in my life, I ignored the wall text. I stayed in the work. I challenged myself, as an artist had suggested, to just notice five things in a piece. I didn't have to be grandiose, like this challenges masculinity in the post-internet age. It was, this pink makes me want to lick it. This green won't let me look away. And bit by bit, the artwork opened up to me. By staying in the work, by paying attention to these decisions, I could ignore the context. I felt like I was finally engaging with an artwork on my own terms. I was seeing it face to face with less artifice and more mystery than I ever had before. And it dawned on me that I think that part of what makes context such a irresistible crutch, such an irresistible shortcut to fall back on, is that that's how our brains work. When we look out at the world, you know, we don't see the world like video cameras, dispassionately, accurately recording the world around us. Our brains are trash compactors. We have these filters of expectation that are preemptively sifting, ignoring, dismissing this raw data coming in, even before we get the full picture. But art? can help us fight the reducing tendencies of our minds. Scientists argue that art introduces a glitch into our brains, a glitch that's really a gift, one that helps our brains jump the curve. No velvet ropes, no made-up language necessary. 
I want to end with one final thought, which is I believe that there is an artist in each of us, in each of you, to the extent that we struggle to keep our brains from compressing our experience of the world. Art is a choice. Art is a fight against complacency. Art it is, is a decision to leave, art is a decision to live a life that's more complicated, more interesting, more mind-blowing, and ultimately more beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.